Good evening and welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News, where we discuss the important events that would have taken place in our country over the past week or so, and is the norm we have always in Guyana a packed agenda of issues to discuss. I want to begin by extending good evening to all of you who are joining us on television in West Coast Barbies. Good evening and welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News. To our viewers who are joining us on television across the Barbies River, along the east bank of Barbies, New Amsterdam, Kanji, and all the way along the quarantine coast, welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News. To our friends and listeners who are joining us on Freedom Radio from Rob Street, Georgetown, welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News. And last but not least, to the thousands of you who are joining us on Facebook Live across Guyana, the Caribbean, Europe, North America, Asia, and even further afield, welcome to another program of Issues in the News. And I see hundreds of you are already on screen. Please press that share button on your phone. Share this program so, as, so that as many persons as possible can join in our tonight's discussion. Share the program, whether you are looking at it on, tele, on, on telephone, whether you're looking at it on your iPad, on your computer. Press that share button to share the program, share the live, so that as many persons as possible can join us in tonight's discussion. The major issue that continues to occupy the minds of Guyanese, both in Guyana and abroad, and rightfully so, is the border controversy with Venezuela. His Excellency the President addressed the nation quite recently on his return from his visit overseas, and I believe was very reassuring in his remarks regarding the controversy with Venezuela and the threat that we continue to face from that Bolivarian Republic and its government. We continue to appeal as a government to all citizens to only listen and read the official channels of communication there are a lot of irresponsible postings, a lot of false postings, a lot of hysterical postings, a lot of fear-mongering contained in postings and the social media in particular. And we caution against such publications. They do nobody any good. They certainly don't have a positive impact on the psyche of Guyanese, and they can lead not only to unnecessary apprehension, tension, stress, but can also lead to provocative acts which can be inimical to our national interest at this point in time. So we continue to appeal to persons not to be doing those things and not to pay heed to those publications. We are awaiting a notification from the International Court of Justice in relation to when they will deliver the ruling to the application which we have made to that court for interim measures. The president of the court announced that the decision will be handed down shortly. 
that's the language used. Obviously, we are entitled to the belief that a decision would be forthcoming before the 3rd of December, as that is the impugned, that is the date, rather, on which the impugned referendum is scheduled to take place in Venezuela. And our application to the court relates directly to the occurrence of that event. So there is every likelihood that the court will render its ruling before that event takes place. The government of Guyana will continue and in fact will intensify its public engagements on this, on this question of the border controversy. I see important institutions within the state, for example, the University of Guyana, and even beyond in the region, are organizing engagements to discuss this very fundamental and import, fundamental and interesting issue. The University of Guyana is holding a second symposium. They have held one before. I see a university from the Caribbean shall be holding one in due course. I have been invited to participate in one of such engagements being hosted by the Bishop's High School. It's a panel discussion and an awareness session. The title of it is Essequibo Belongs to Guyana. It's scheduled for the 24th of November, 2023 at 10 a.m. And the pan panelists will include yours truly, the Honorable Carl Greenwich and Dr. Mark Curtin. As you are aware, Carl Greenwich is the agent for Guyana. This case was instituted while the APNU AFC was in government. And from the inception, dating back prior to independence, if there is one thing that the People's Progressive Party and the People's National Congress have stood solidly and unitedly on, it is the issue of this border controversy. These two major political parties at different epoch of our at different epochs of our history, irrespective of who was in the leadership of the two parties, have stood together on this matter of our territorial integrity and national sovereignty. And I'm happy that such a position continues until today. So when the case was instituted, President Granger had engaged leader of the opposition, Mr. Bharat Jagdeo, and the entire opposition at that time in the parliament, and we pledged, as we have always done, our fullest support to the government to institute the legal proceedings. It will be recalled that prior to that, while the PPP was in government from 1992, 
until 2015, we continued the good office protocols and process as outlined in the Geneva Agreement. I think that particular mechanism as a procedure seeking a resolution of this issue begun in 1987. It continued from 1992 when the PPP got into office until 2015 when I believe it was unanimously agreed that it was not yielding or it has not yielded any success. It was then that the decision was made to institute, well, to refer the matter to the Secretary General of the United Nations pursuant to Clause 4 of the Geneva Agreement of 1966. And under that agreement, the United Nations Sec Secretary General is empowered to recommend a course of action that in his opinion can bring a resolution to the matter. And the recommendation that came from the Secretary General of the United Nations is to refer the matter to the International Court of Justice, the principal judicial arm of the United Nations for its consideration and resolution. When that recommendation was made, the government at the time engaged the leader of the opposition and indeed the entire opposition and we rendered our full support to that course of action. Carl Greenwich at that time was the Minister of Foreign Affairs and he was chosen to act as the agent for Guyana, which is a requirement at the International Court of Justice. Each state that carries a case to that court and each defendant that, or, or each state who is a defendant in that course, court is required to appoint an agent and the agent is in the place of the claimant because the parties there are countries. So Mr. Greenwich was the agent for Guyana and significantly when the government changed to show our continuous support and to show that we are completely united on this issue, our government did not choose to change the agent. We could have done that and appointed Minister Todd or anyone else. But because this is a matter upon which we are solidly and unanimously compacted, we did not change the status quo. And that shows our commitment and our commitment to the cause as a political party and as a government. So Mr. Greenwich continues to act as our agent in that case. We have to wait until the decision is handed down. The question that has been asked and the question that is occupying the minds of many persons is whether Venezuela and its government will comply with any edict emanating from the International Court of Justice. And that question has arisen with greater seriousness having regard to the utterances that keep coming from top government officials of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. The world saw 
and heard the address of the vice president of that country to the International Court of Justice and her press briefing, which ensued the hearing of that court. Well, as I've indicated elsewhere, I prefer to wait rather than speculate. But what we can assure, and I believe the President alluded to it, is that the court itself has the wherewithal and the legal repertoire and authority internationally and on the international law to enforce its own judgment. The enforcement arm of the court is the United Nations Security Council. Any court, even magistrate's court or municipal courts, have a power to enforce their orders. It is that coercive power that keeps the majesty of the court intact. It is the capacity to enforce its orders that demands veneration and respect from any court of law. Or else, if a court grants orders that it is incapable of enforcing, then that court will lose its all. It will lose the respect that it deserves. It will lose its majesty as an important law enforcement institution. And it will become a rubber stamp. I can't imagine that the International Court of Justice, which is the pinnacle and the very summit of the international legal structure will be a court that is unable to enforce its own orders. Quite apart from that, of course, we have our own national capabilities, and in addition to that, we have secured the assistance and we have secured the support of the entire hemisphere. Other than Nicaragua, I have not heard another country in this hemisphere supporting the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela on this matter. And the entire hemisphere and all the important international organizations, including the United Nations, the Organization of American States, the Commonwealth, CARICOM, and others, have all registered their support and their, their support for Guyana and their condemnation of Venezuela. I say all of that in an attempt to further assure you that there is no need to panic and to move into a mode of hysteria. As I said, the government will continue in the next few days and beyond to engage in public interactions of different types in an effort to bring greater awareness to this matter. It is a matter of fundamental importance and I can't overemphasize that issue and our government is treating it with the importance 
that he deserves. And that's what I want to see at this point in time. Monday, that's Monday coming, I believe the 27th, I'll be leading a delegation from Guyana to attend the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, CFATF, 57th Plenary and Working Group Meetings from November the 26th to December the 1st in Aruba. This is a very important engagement. Guyana, as we all know, is part and parcel of the Caribbean Action Task Force. That is the umbrella regulatory body of the AML-CFT international framework for this hemisphere in this region. And Guyana is a member and must like every other country, participate in these plenary and other engagements. You are already aware that we have concluded our mutual assessment recently, and we are in the process, as I indicated, I believe, some time ago, we are in the process of responding to a preliminary report which was done based upon that on-site um, assessment. We will attend this meeting, and I believe at the next uh, plenary meeting, Guyana's report will be for discussion, and we will be graded, I think, at that session. So, as I said, I want this program to be as engaging as possible, so I am looking for your comments, I'm looking for your views. Please share the program. Make sure that as many persons as possible join us in tonight's discussion by pressing that share button on your phone or on your computer. You allow all your friends and all your followers to join in tonight's discussion. So many of you may recall the incident at the specialized organized or the special organized crime unit which occurred in November, I think, last year, involving attorney at law, Tamika Clark. Ms. Clark attended that office and attempted to engage a client who was not in custody but was assisting the police with investigations into a multi-million dollar fraud. Whatever transpired there, Ms. Clark was asked to go upstairs in an office where her phone was taken from her by a police officer and she was kept in that office for about 20 minutes. When the incident occurred, it was drawn to my attention about 30 or 45 minutes after. I briefed myself, first of all, make sure I, get, I got all the facts, and I advised the officers at Soku, I advised the head of Soku to immediately release Ms. Clark. I called Ms. Clark on her cell phone. I apologized to Ms. Clark 
for the unfortunate incident and she was immediately released. A huge issue arose in the press about this matter. I went on television, I spoke on this program, and I reiterated my apologies to Ms. Clark. I did so in my capacity as a lawyer. I did so in my capacity as Attorney General and Head of the Bar. And I did so in my capacity as a Minister of the Government. I felt that an unfortunate error of judgment had occurred. And for that, I led the charge with the apology. Of course, that apology was not enough. And I received a letter. Well, there were protests and a lot of statements in the press condemning the police and their actions, even condemning me. Some persons were accusing me of interfering with the police. Well, I don't know about interference. I know that I have to appear and defend these things in court. And it is a government of which I am a part that is ordered to pay compensation when findings are made by courts of law in relation to these excesses. So I have a duty to intervene when I see issues like this happening. And I will continue to do so. It's part of my mandate. I am the Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs. That being said, I received a letter threatening litigation. I responded and I offered a settlement. I explained in a letter to the lawyers representing Ms. Clark that, you know, the state is prepared to engage in settlement talks because I don't believe that this is a matter that we should litigate. All my entreaties were rejected. I put an offer on the table, I believe, in writing, offering $2 million in compensation, and that offer was rejected. A counter offer was made of $50 million. Right there and then I realized that the lawyers were appearing for Ms. Clark are not interested in a settlement. They can't be interested in a settlement by demanding $50 million. So they were milking this issue for their own public aggrandizement. They were milking this issue to pursue their own agenda. Because you can't have your client's interest at heart and your client's best interest when you are demanding from the state $50 million for a person who was detained in an air-conditioned office offered to sit on soft cushion chairs for some 15 to 20 minutes. So the legal proceedings came and I did not contest liability. I did not contest liability. I said, let's go straight to damages. The police is wrong. We accept that. Let's go to damages. Remember, I offered 200, 2 million. That was rejected. And a counter of 50 million was made. I have a duty as Attorney General to protect the public purse. I have a fiduciary duty not to squander taxpayers' money and pay out exorbitant and excesses, excessive 
compensation packages. When the law has a measurement on how damages are to be assessed and compensation is calculated. And there are numerous case laws, case law authorities rather, where judges have awarded sums of money for this type of issue. The issue here is one of false imprisonment. People are locked up for days, weeks, in a lockup, a police lockup. Sometimes not in the best of conditions. And they get a two million or a three million dollars in damages by the very judges of our courts. And in addressing the issue of compensation, a prudent lawyer would take those awards and those facts and put them before the court in this particular case to show that this case involved a citizen being locked up at breakdown for seven days and the court gave him two million dollars. In this case, a citizen was locked up for a weekend at Maikoni police station in the lockups and this person got 1.5 million. And here it is that this person, the one attorney at law, was detained for 15 minutes, 20 minutes in an air conditioned office and won $50 million. We were ordered to put our arguments and our submissions in on the question of damages only. Because as I said, we conceded liability. We said that we are wrong. And you know what the court ordered? The court ordered $700,000. $700,000. Why I am making this point? I am making this point because every day, almost every day, I receive pre-litigation letters Letters threatening litigation from various agencies and various persons through their attorneys at law. And not one of them make a sensible demand, make a reasonable demand for compensation from the state. Every one of them, they make demands that are unworthy of responding to. So when I get them, I just throw them aside. Because they want 100 million, 40 million, 50 million. And this case, I hope, would be an eye opener. Because here it is, it's an attorney at law. And what was the measure of damages? $700,000. The Chief Justice further ordered that the police officers apologize, and they did. We have no difficulty with that. We accepted liability. I apologize. Of course the police will apologize. And the Chief Justice asked that the police force inco incorporate in their training manuals issues that will prevent matters and, and, and subject matters that will prevent the reoccurrence of this type of unfortunate error of judgment. So the, so the police manuals, training manuals, will have to be adjusted and to include matters that hopefully will prevent the reoccurrence of matters of this type. Now, I'm not trivializing in any way what happened to Ms. Clark. I see one lawyer posting the judgment and posting the apology letter in this boastful manner that it took a judgment of the High Court for the police to apologize. 
Well, the Attorney General himself apologized. But they never, not once did they give the Attorney General or the government of Guyana credit, or even the police force credit, for the Attorney General's apology. Not once. But they are showcasing the police apology, saying that it had to take a court order for that to come. If the occasion had presented itself, the police would have apologized upon my advice. But the important thing is that I am happy that the court has remained grounded in this matter. And hopefully this will be a guidance to those who believe that they can come and extract exorbitant sums of money from the state. As I said, I offered two million without spending a year in court. The case spent a year in court. This could have been avoided. We could have avoided a judge spending one year on this matter. We could have avoided the lawyers spending one year in this matter. We could have avoided all the energy and resources. We could have avoided sitting hours and hours and doing written submissions. All of that could have been avoided if good sense had prevailed. But persons were grinding their own axes. Persons were pursuing a different agenda. So Miss Clark, in the end, is the one who lost. Because instead of two million, which she would have gotten since last year, she got 700,000. 700,000. It goes to show that lawyers are not necessarily pursuing the cause that they are retained to pursue. They are not pursuing their client's best interest, but they are pursuing their own agenda and of course getting the requisite publicity from it. Well I'm happy that the court has ruled and that has bring this matter that has brought this matter to to an abrupt end. We have received a notification from the Court of Appeal informing that the matter of Claudette Thorne and another versus Keith Lowenfield, that's petition number 88 of 2020, that decision which is pending at the Court of Appeal will be delivered on the 27th of November at 2 p.m. So this is the second elections petition. Petition number 88. Remember, it was thrown out like petition number 99 at the High Court level. They have appealed, as they have a right to do, and we will have the decision handed down on the 27th of November at 2 p.m. by the Court of Appeal. Viewers will recall that this is the petition that challenged Order 60 of 2020, under which the recount the national recount was done. This, <laughs> let me remind you what this is about. Order 60 of 2020 was the order drafted by GCOM. GCOM comprising of two PPP commissioners and two 
PNC commissioners and the chairperson, they sat and they drafted a unanimous order. None of them disagreed with it. There was no vote taken on Order 60. GCOM sat down and GCOM made a decision that GCOM will recount the ballot and GCOM will recount the ballot in accordance with an order that they crafted called Order 60. And when the results did not suit the PNC, they challenged Order 60. The very order that their commissioner, their commissioners sat down and crafted at GCOM. But what is new? Every single day, you see this, these types of double standards. So the Court of Appeal has fixed the date for ruling. What can I say? Many people may be asking, what do you think? Will we win? Will we lose? Well, we have the PPP government, and the PPP is a political party. We have a sordid record at the Court of Appeal. I don't think that we have won. We have received a single favorable ruling since 2020. And that's the record. I'm not making this up. I'm not casting any aspersions. I have the greatest of respect for every hierarchical structure of the judiciary in our country, beginning from the magistracy all the way to the Caribbean Court of Justice. But the statistical data will show that we have not been able to get a favorable ruling from that court in these political matters. And we have been able to get almost 100% reversal when we go to the Caribbean Court of Justice. Again, I am not saying anything that you don't know. But sometimes it's good to reflect upon these things. It's good to reflect upon these things. So, there's a gentleman who is permeating the airwaves and the social media with some commentary that I have listened to because people have sent to me. I don't know the gentleman very well. I heard about him, saw him a couple of times, never spoke to him as far as I can recall. But I don't know what has triggered this gentleman. But this gentleman has been, has unleashed a tirade of attack predominated with expletives, a decent language, libeling the president, the vice president, yours truly, saying the most obnoxious and toxic things, making wild and reckless allegations, destroying people's character and how, how does a government not respond? How does an attorney general and a minister with responsibility for legal affairs stay quiet in the face of such 
criminality and criminal outpourings, multiple criminal offenses are being committed. Children are exposed to the worst type of expletives and this guy is saying it repeatedly, consciously. Some people may hold the view that if one is to respond, if the state is to respond, if the law enforcement agencies are to respond, then this guy can become a hero and perhaps that's what he wants. But does the state stay silent? Does the state has the option of remaining silent in the face of such vitriol and such morbid onslaught and indecent outbursts. This widespread slaughtering of people's reputation, does a state stay, stay silent and allow this to continue and this rampage to go without any attention, any any application of the law. So if the state is to turn a blind eye, this guy goes on scathe, becomes even more emboldened, and does worse. And then others will emulate. Because if others see that this type of conduct attracts no sanction, doesn't attract an application of the law, then every person who becomes angered by whatever the issue is can do similarly because there is no incentive not. So all inhibitions are going to be removed and everyone will begin to do and say as they feel. Well, that is anarchy. That is anarchy. Then you will have those who will come forth as the champion of freedom of expression. Well, if this constitutes freedom of expression, and if this is what the Constitution permits, then something is fundamentally wrong with the law and our Constitution. No person in this society who is rational, and this has nothing to do with politics, no person who has a rational mind would want to live in a society where a person who is angry for whatever reason chooses, chooses to display his anger in that way then we are not living in a civilized society. Of course, persons of his ilk are encouraging him. And they are having him on talk show programs and, on, and entertaining him. Why? First of all, they are persons of the same ilk. That's the first thing. So they find commonality. And secondly, because the attack is directed to their political opponents is directed to the government, is directed to the PPP. And these are haters of the PPP and the PPP administration and PPP persons, ministers within the government. They find a common ally. The problem is that this character, this, this animal, for want of a better word, that you're dealing with, knows no bond and today he may be attacking x tomorrow unless he's restrained he's going to attack you persons who are behaving this way and whose outpourings 
are so toxic and are of such a nature is damaging to the public good. This is a societal issue. It, this, is a this is the type of society that we want to live in. You want your children to go on the Facebook and listen to this man and listen to his rants and listen to his abuse and the decent language and you want your children to want to emulate that kind of conduct when they get angry? Well, if that is the society you want, well then I suppose you will find that behavior acceptable. Well, I would want to believe that Guyanese want to live in a good place and in a good and healthy society. Yes, we can have our political and other differences, but when you descend to that, then you will lose, society loses its moral compass. If 10 like that happens tomorrow and another 10 the following day, where will that leave us as a society? And that is what I want to speak to you about. It has nothing to do with the individual. It has to do with the conduct. That is not healthy. That is a threat to society. It's a threat to law and order. It's a threat to public order. And the law enforcement agencies have to react. Based, on, based upon what I'm hearing, this man claims to have vital information about a number of very high profile killings in this country. And he has named them he has named the killings and he boastfully says that he has the information. How can a police force still investigating most of these crimes or is under criticism because the public believes that these crimes have not been properly investigated not invite this gentleman to assist them with these investigations that the police themselves are being criticized for. This gentleman seemed to have a wealth of information, a reservoir of knowledge that can only aid and assist the police in continuing their investigations. They have to invite him. I hope that they do. I don't direct the police force. But I can't imagine that a police force would have a man saying these things and having all this information and will not move to have his assistance secured. Someone sent me a clip where the gentleman says that he has bribed judges of the Caribbean Court of Justice when they were in Guyana. That clip will be sent to the Caribbean Court of Justice. He said that he has bribed the female judge of the Caribbean Court of Justice. And he has the evidence to show that he has bribed that person. I heard that myself. Someone sent the clip to me. So no one is safe. That's the point I'm making. No one is safe. The Caribbean Court of Justice has been the subject of attack. You think there's any restraint anymore? The president 
has been vilified in the worst possible manner. The vice president, the judges, the very judges of our court system, you think they are safe? You think that you are safe? That is the society that you want to live in? That is not the society that I want to live in, and I plan to live here for the rest of my life. So I thought that I would express those views on that issue. Of course, I have no doubt that I will be the subject of even greater plunder now. No doubt I will be the victim tomorrow and whenever else. Because the attention will now be focused on me. And I'll become the subject of attack. But I owe a duty, even if I was not Attorney General, as a citizen of this country, as a, an attorney at law, to speak out on this matter, on conduct of this type. I have a little son. I don't want him to grow up in a society where people speak and behave like that. It's frightening. It's frightening. Whether I'm attorney general or not, I would have been saying the same thing that I'm saying now, because this is my country. And I plan to live here for the rest of my life. And there is not going to be people like that behaving in a public manner, causing our societal standard to descend to the lower abyss that that kind of narrative can take it. No, it will not happen. I have unfortunately used up a lot of time speaking on this matter, but I believe that I needed to. And I feel good having spoken about it. I want to thank you for being with me for the past hour, I think that we have covered a number of important issues. Next week, unfortunately, as you heard, I will not be here. I'll be representing our country at the CFATF conference in Aruba. Or I may be even before the ICG, I'm not sure. So until we meet again, please enjoy the rest of the week. And stay healthy, stay safe, and we will resume this discourse very shortly. I thank you very much, and I'll see you next time.